welcome to the Regeneration Project's Sunday gathering for worship. Um, we're giving thanks to God today. Um, we just got some really good news um, this morning uh, from Priscilla and uh, her mother and family. Her mom's doing a lot better. Oh, yeah. Uh, the testimony is that she's sitting up, Thank she's God. eating, she's responsive. And so we give God thanks and we give God praise. And we're continuing to pray for everyone who's still struck yes. by this really horrible pandemic, this horrible disease. And for other folks, because there's still other illnesses happening. Yeah. Uh, so we're really mindful of those who are yeah. struggling with cancer. Yes. And we wish them uh, victory in that fight and to everyone that's fighting with other um, life limiting and some, in some cases, terminal conditions. We trust in God because we know that God is a healer. God is a deliverer. And God, we also trust God because we know that we are forever safe in God's loving arms. Amen? Amen. So we're grateful and we're thankful. This is what we'd like to read for our reflection this morning, just to kind of orientate our minds around worship. Psalm 25. And I'd like to read verses 1 through to 7 from Psalm 25. The first stanza says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let, do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantless, wantonly treacherous. Then the psalmist says, Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. And then the psalmist prays. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, God will instruct sinners in the right way. God leads the humble in what is right and teaches and teach the humble God's way. All the powers of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. And for those who keep God's covenant and God's decrees. And all the people said, Amen. And so unto you, Lord, do I lift up my soul. And this idea of the soul has to do with the whole of our being. Everything that concerns us everything that there is about us. And there's sort of, um, depending on how you think about it, there's sort of 10 dimensions of life. So you have your intellectual life, mental. You have your emotional life. You have your relational life. You have your social life. Your psychological life. And, and your vocational life. You have your avocational life. Things like gym and sports and TV programs you enjoy. Uh, you have your financial life and all of those dimensions of your life. And so wherever you are, we want to lift those up to the Lord this morning. We want to lift up to the Lord our thoughts. And sometimes we are plagued with negative thoughts. Things maybe somebody said, sometimes it might be a look. Different things trigger us in different ways. Maybe we read a post and the post is not particularly nice and we react and respond to it. And so we lift up our thoughts to God. And we ask God to heal us in our thought patterns, in the schemas of our mind, in the way we construct reality, the way we perceive reality, we ask for a healing. Now we think about our emotional well-being, our feelings, and all kinds of feelings from rage to resentment to joy, to ecstasy, to satisfaction and peace. <coughs> but to you, O oh Lord, we lift up our emotional life before you. There is not one dimension of our life and our being that is hidden from you. 
you know and understand us from the inside and out. We surrender our feelings to you, Lord. Our feelings of anger, our feelings of frustration, our feelings of joy, our feelings of anticipation, our feelings of hope. We surrender those things to you and we ask that you would heal us in our feelings. Those of us in terms of our vocation, careers, whether we're students or we're in the middle of a, there are careers and our jobs, we're praying to God that God will bless us, that God will allow us to be productive in the things to which we set our hands and our minds. We pray that God will bless us to be fruitful and to be effective and impactful in the things that we set out to do. We ask God to give us strength, strength to stay the course. We ask God to give us strength to manage the stress that comes from trying to achieve something. We give you thanks and we give you praise, O oh Lord, for the inner energy to survive the onslaught of different circumstances and situations in which we face. We pray for our families. We lift up our families and our family relationships to you. God, we pray out of strife you will create peace. Out of devastation you will create a beautiful garden of relating and relationships. Where there are blockages and misunderstanding, create pathways and neural pathways for communication and openness. We ask, oh God, that you would give healing in families, blessings in families. And we worship and adore you because you are the God who makes all things new. And we praise you right now. Let's lift up the Lord's name in praise right now as we give God glory. And wherever you are, whatever you are doing, lift up your life to God. Maybe the areas of your life that I have not mentioned, but we trust God not to put us to shame. I was watching this morning um, on TikTok. There was one in the Olympics. There was a woman from one of the Eastern African nations, either Eritrea or Ethiopia. And she was starting in, um, I think it was a 200 meter race. And uh, she started in the race and somebody in front of her fell. And she tripped over that person. And she got up, she picked herself up. Everybody had left her behind. This is the Olympics, what she'd been training for all of her life. And somebody had fallen down and tripped her up. But I watched this woman get up. I watched her pull herself together. I watched her run, run for her life. She came from the back into the middle, and from the middle into the front, and wow. one goal. Wow. One goal. Wow. I tell you, to me, that it brought tears to my eyes yes. to see how you can have a fall. Yes. You can get tripped up. Yes. Some adversity can get in your way, but there's no reason for you to give up. There's no reason for you to not go. You may have to work harder. And she ran her heart out. But she triumphed because she refused to give up. And so we just ask God to hide us in the palm of God's hand so that when the storms come, we will stand strong. Somebody praise the Lord right now. Somebody praise the Lord right now. Somebody give him glory. Give God glory. Give God glory.
God in His grace and His mercy. It's good to see you all this morning. Everyone here at St. Mark's, it's good to see you. It's good to um, see you in a sense. You guys are joining us uh, virtually um, via Facebook Live. Um, our subject today is prayer. Everyone say prayer. 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 That's our subject um, today. You know, when, when we talk about prayer, I think one of the things that shapes the way in which we pray is our understanding of who God is. You know, who God is, how God is, our theology about God, about the kingdom of God, shapes and determines the way in which we pray. And so I often ask the question, who are you praying to? You know, are you praying to the angry God? You know, the God that is mad at you. The God that's ready, ready just to strike you down. A moment, without a moment's notice, ready to take you out. Because that will shape how you pray. Because when you pray, you would assume that God is angry, and you would assume that God's anger is pointed at you, and so your prayers will reflect that. Are you praying at the down in the God? The, the one who is hard and difficult to please, and you get a sense that you're not pleasing him. Because that's how you will shape God. You will say things, here am I, but a worm, O Lord, before your presence. You know, are you praying for the God who is far away and uninvolved? The one who is too high, too holy to be involved with the affairs of the human being. Because if you are, you will pray without passion. You will pray without uh, um, that, that, that spark that, that makes your prayers powerful. Are you praying to the fickle or the capricious God, the one who is prone to mood swings? Because if you are, your prayer will reflect something like a pagan worship service, where you keep offering and offering and offering until you get God's um, attention. Are you praying to the absent or abandoning God, those, the one that you sense isn't there and you don't expect to hear from? Or are you praying to the sugar dad God? Mm. You know, the Father Christmas of all gods. The one who is just dishing out, just dishing it out. And all you've got to do is ask. And you can have anything you want. Are you praying to that God? Or are you praying to the stingy God? The one you've got to beg. You've got to pray with me, saints. Because if we don't pray, it's not going to happen. Because somehow God doesn't want. And therefore, whenever we pray, it's always necessary to remind ourselves about who God is. And I want you to know today that He is a good, good Father, and that we are loved by Him. Every time you go into prayer, no matter how good you feel or bad you feel, no matter what you feel, always go in with that knowledge that He is a good, good Father. And you are his beloved. He has set his love on you. And I guarantee it will change the way you pray. And it will change how your prayers impact. You know, when we talk about prayer, there's a number of things that bother me. Everyone say bother. Bother. You know, now this is just feels bothering. So it may not be your bothering, but it's just my bothering. Things that bother Phil. Things that bother me about what I've been taught about prayer, whether deliberately or, or, or in adverse, uh, inadvertently, there are a number of things that over the years, over my 20 odd years of being a Christian, I've been taught about prayer. One of the things I've been taught about prayer is I can have anything I want. Anything. Just what I want. Just, all I've got to do is just ask. I can have, and I can tell you, over 20 years, that is not true. Yes. Just, just not true. God doesn't work like that. Life doesn't work like that. One of the other things I've been inadvertently taught about prayer is that when I don't get the answers that I want, that there is something wrong with me. There is something wrong with the way that I'm praying. That somehow I'm not good enough. I'm not holy enough. I'm not giving enough. Oh, God didn't answer my prayer because I never gave him the sweetest connection. Or, you know, I'm not believing enough. And I mean, I don't know what you've got to do to believe. I don't know what you just like scooch your face. Like, I'm bleeding all now. 
But you know, people tell you, you well, if you can believe, you should get the answer that you want. And so it is in for God. But, but, you know, um, yeah, but we, we pray faster and louder because of that, maybe that will be a problem. And that's one of the things I've been taught, that if I don't get the answer I want, then there's something wrong with me. And I think I'd say to say, there's nothing wrong with us. There is nothing. There's nothing to do with what you've done. God doesn't work like that. Tell somebody God's not like you. God's not like you. And he's not like me. And because we know how we are, don't we? You know, that's how we behave. God is not like that. I've been taught some, uh, somewhere along the line, I've been taught that if someone doesn't pray, God won't act. You, you know, um, the, 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 you know, we need to pray because if we don't pray, God ain't going to do it. Like God happily sits by watching injustice yes. and pain and suffering. And it's like, oh, someone's just prayed. I think I will free that person now, or heal that person, or bless that person, or step into that. And I, and I, and I want to let you know that whilst prayer is important, prayer is not the thing that makes God move. God is ready to do it for you. You know, one of the other things that I've been taught is that God only listens to certain people's prayers. You know, if you can get that person to pray for you, yeah. that's the one you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, or I've been taught that it depends how many people like, like there's, a, there's a number, yeah. you know, and I wish God would tell me what the number is, yeah. so I could just get it all sorted up front, you know, is it 10 or is it 20, how many people need to pray in order for stuff to happen, and we teach things like this, don't we, we teach things like God only listens to certain people, and so that makes you feel your prayers are ineffectual, because God's not listening to me as much as he's listening to you, and he makes you feel ineffectual, because, well, maybe not enough people are praying, you know, God doesn't need a quota of people to move, to do stuff, to bless stuff. You know, um, I've been taught that, uh, that, that prayer is a magic formula. You know, I love this one. You know when you bless your food? Yeah. You know it's wrong. It looks wrong. Yeah. Make it help. That's a lie. <laughs> there is nothing that's going to make that greasy burger and those three time cooked fries that have been deep fried any more healthy. You know, but we pray like that. Like it's a magic formula. Abracadabra, focus, focus, and make it happen in Jesus' name. That's what we do. You know, um, I've been taught over the years that you're not serious unless you pray for X amount of time, at X times a day, in this very specific way, because at this time, this and this and this happens. And, you know, I've been taught that the, the, the less you do that, you're not serious about it. And one of the other things that I've been taught about prayer, and I think we've all been taught this one, that we think prayer is about talking a lot. We talk a lot. In Mexico, we go to prayer meetings. I mean, I don't know how God hears it in there. It's just people talking loud and loud, fast and fast and fast. And you know, saying all of those things, um, I pray for the things I need. And I pray for the things I want as well. And we're going to talk about this in a bit. You know, saying all of that, I believe in prayer for the afflicted. I believe the prayer of righteous people avails much. I believe that. I believe in praying as a community. I believe that it's important that we don't just pray individually, but we pray communally, together. I believe that sometimes when we pray, miraculous things happen. You know, and I can, I can testify to, to stuff happening as people have prayed, as, as I have prayed. And over the years I've discovered a number of things. I've discovered over the things that, that whilst I will often pray for the things I need and I will often pray for the things I want, I don't always get what I want. And sometimes I don't always get what I feel I need. And what I have come to realise that that is not a reflection on me, it's not a reflection on my praying style, it's just the way life is. Some prayers get answered and some prayers don't get answered. I, I come to realise that blab and grab is not a biblical prayer technique. No. <laughs> you know, I, 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 and, and one of the things I've discovered over the years that, that, that prayer uh, uh, is not and cannot uh, be about the, uh, us as disciples getting everything we want. Mm -hmm. 
Prayer has to be more than just us trying to get the things that we want in life. It has to be more. I have discovered over the years that I don't need to twist God's arm. I don't need to bend God's arm. I don't need to try and hoodwink God into doing something. God, if you do this, I will do uh, uh, that. I don't need to um, twist God's arm to bless you. I don't need to invoke the angels of Africa or blow the wind of God on it. I don't need to do any of these things to make God bless you. God wants to bless us and God is blessing us. I have discovered over the years that God hears my prayers. Say that with me. God hears my prayers. And sometimes I reckon God rolls his eyes at my prayers. I reckon God does, oh, right, okay, we're here again, are we, Phil? Okay, you, you go on, and when you're done, we'll have a chat. Yeah. You know, and I realise that God hears my prayers, and some of my prayers get answered, and some of my prayers don't get answered, and some of my prayers get answered in different ways, but regardless of whatever the result or the outcome, I am confident in the fact that God hears every one of my prayers. I've discovered over the years that prayer is not about moving God in as much as it's about my journey, my reflection, and it's about how I let the Holy Spirit move me, how I let see change and transformation in my life. Prayer is ultimately about me. It's ultimately about my life being ordered and being shaped and being guided by the faith that I have in God. I have discovered, I have discovered, that, that, that I can be extremely selfish, greedy, and uncompassionate mm -hmm. in praise. Sorry, it's confession. I know you guys don't have this problem. But, yeah. but you know, I have discovered that sometimes I have come out of prayer and I've heard God say, Really? Okay, then. Thanks, Phil. And I've discovered that I can be extremely greedy, extremely selfish, and extremely uncompassionate. And that's been a catalyst for me to change who I am becoming and the, and the way I am. I have discovered that sometimes my need for you to pray for me is, is not about getting the numbers up, but it's about me feeling compassion of other people. I've discovered these things um, through that. I have discovered that sometimes I can be really animated and passionate in prayer, and other times... I'm just not, or less so. And so I have discovered that sometimes prayer is about saying nothing. And I've discovered that I often need to listen a lot more than I do talking in prayer. I have discovered that there are different ways to pray, and each of these ways have a time and a place, and there is no right way or no perfect way. All of them have their place. And their time. I have discovered all of these things, and one of the most important things I've discovered is I've discovered that prayer works. Tell somebody prayer works. Prayer works. But it doesn't necessarily work in the way I think it works, mm -hmm. or the way I sometimes want it to work. Um, Paul shared a, a quote last week, and uh, it's a quote from Brian McLaren. The quote says, The kingdom of God then is a revolutionary countercultural movement claiming a ceaseless rebellion against the tyranny, tyrannical trinity of money, sex, and power. Its citizens resist the occupation of this invisible Caesar through three categories of spiritual practice. First, they practice a liberating generosity towards support to defund, greed, and topple the regime of money. Second, they practice the kind of prayer that is a defying act of resistance against the prideful pursuit of power, pursuing forgiveness and reconciliation, not re retaliation and revenge. Finally, they practice fasting to revolt against the dominating impulses of physical gratification so that the sex drive and other physical appetite, appetites will not become our slave drivers. All of these are practiced covertly and secret so they aren't corrupted into an external show as the hypocrites do. And it's from this quote that I want to I get my title today of what I want to talk about. I want to talk about prayer as a defiant act of resistance. That's what I want to talk about today. Now, Jesus says in the book of, or, or Matthew records Jesus saying in the book of um, Matthew chapter 6, and he says this, um, 
It says, and when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogue and on the street corners, so they will be seen by people. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But as for you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use vain a thoughtless um, repetition as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you will need before you ask him. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive other people their offences, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive other people, then your heavenly Father will not forgive your offences. You know, in the world that Jesus was a part of, religion was a big part of that world. And in the world that Jesus um, was a part of, religious practices and, current, uh, and um, the currency of that day that people traded in was religio religiosity, was being religious. Yes. In that day, religion opened doors for you. It mattered how you looked. It mattered how your religion looked. Religion was access to social benefits, economic benefits, political benefits in, in Jesus' day. And, and, and so, in Jesus' day, religion was a currency. It's not so much the same in, in this day and age. We have a very different way of, uh, of way in which religion is practiced and experienced as part of our society. But yet, some of the same things still dominate our religions of our day. You know, what Jesus is writing about in this text is what you see when you go into some churches. We've all been into um, some of those churches, particularly the more Pentecostal, charismatic type of churches that, that, that we come from. And, you know, if I was to go into a lot of, um, uh, uh, or some churches, and if I was to just pray in a very kind of monotone and matter-of-fact way, yeah. I guarantee you one thing, that would give me no spiritual kudos. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, people would feel like a bit disappointed. Yeah. Is that what you've got? Yeah. You know, people would be like, I mean, wouldn't do me any favors as a preacher. I wouldn't be put on a preaching list. Because those kind of things matter in some kinds of churches. You know, whereas if I went into a church like that and I pronounced my words and I accentuated certain parts of the prayer, and if I used tones specifically and silence specifically and threw a few kind of obscure or more obscure words in there. I, I guarantee you, you can get people excited. You know, if I was to sort of say, almighty and most holy, magnificent, omniscient, omnipresent, all-knowing, all-powerful God. Yes. You know, need a pause sometimes. And if I was to to, to pray, the one who in his power and might brought the world into existence, the one who the very foundations of the world tremble in fear at. Yes. We need your power today. For us to say something along the line like that, uh, along the lines like, we come to you in the glory of your grandeur, of your splendor, your magnificence, and your majesty. And we implore you today to bless us. With your manifold blessing. Yes, Lord. Pull us from the crag mire of our circumstance. Thwart the nefarious acts of Satan. Pour out your bountiful blessing. Wow. You know, now if I was to pray like that, yeah. seriously, it's not as just mocking, but it's not get a book in. <laughs> you know, people would respond to that. People would get excited. But do you know what I'd pray with all of those words? Yeah. I'd pray, dear Lord, bless us and help us. That's all I've said. Yeah. In all of those words, that is all I have said. Years ago, I remember me and Paul going to an event, and there was a preacher there. I can't remember his name or where he was from, but I remember him praying. And one of us leave over to the others, and, and you know, he, he, he wasn't a full-time preacher. He worked in an office somewhere on Monday or, or a place in Monday. 
And we, one of us leaned over to the other, I can't remember who it was, and one of us said, Do you think he prays, he talks like that in the manager's meeting tomorrow? <laughs> Do you think he talks like that at the photocopy tomorrow? And the answer was, Of course not. Because no one in their right mind would go in the workplace and talk in that kind of way. And, and, you know, one of the things that Jesus wants us to get from this is that when you pray, don't make it an act. Yeah. Jesus says when you pray, and the assumption here is that the audience that is listening to Jesus will pray. And I think when we talk about prayer, I think both people that are um, religious and people that have faith and people that are non-religious all have some way of reaching beyond their self out in what we would call prayer. They may not call it prayer, they may not direct it to the God that we believe in, but I think most people have a way of reaching beyond their self when they find that they need something, that they have an inability to, to, to make happen. Jesus says, when you pray, drop the acts, drop the performance, drop the charade. Uh, the message says, don't turn it into a theatrical production. That's what Jesus says. Jesus says, when, when people do this, it's pointless, it's meaningless. What Jesus says is they've got their reward. And, and the essence of what Jesus is saying there, what they wanted was people to see it. And what Jesus is saying is, well done, they see you. They see you, you've got your reward. All of that, if that's what you wanted, you know, if you wanted to people to think, oh wow, look how devout and spiritual that person is, well, congratulations, you've got that. And so Jesus says that kind of prayer is pointless, it's meaningless, there is no point to it, it does nothing. Jesus says when you pray, and there are a few things he says in the text, he says, first of all, do it in secret and keep it secret. Yeah. Tell someone secret, 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 you know? We've all met the person that loves to go around, I've been praying for. I've been praying for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, we've all met that kind of guy. No, 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 when you pray, you know, oh, oh, this is what I've been praying about this week, everybody. No, no, when you pray, pray in secret. Do it in secret and keep it secret. The other thing is, Jesus said when you pray, says, don't think you're going to be heard because you pray a lot or talk a lot. Don't, um, don't use thoughtless repetition. Now, he throws the word in here, vain or thoughtless. Well, and what it means, it means statements that you, you're not even thinking about saying. You're just saying them because they sound like the right thing to say. You know? And there's, there's a real, and we can all be guilty of that. How many of you have ever put your hand up? And, and I've, I've caught myself doing it sometimes. I've been in a worship service and I've put my hand up. And then I thought, oh, why am I putting my hand up? And it's because somewhere in my brain says, you're in a worship service, put your hand up. And so now, when I engage in worship or prayer, I have to be mindful of what I'm doing and make sure that when I'm putting my hands up or uttering a phrase out, that I mean that, that that comes from yes. a place of meaning. And this is what Jesus is talking about in prayer. Don't use vain repetition, thoughtless, re uh, repetitious phrases that don't mean anything. And thirdly, the third thing that we get from this is say what you need to say and then listen. Yeah. Does somebody just say what you need to say? Just say, just say, say what you need to say, say and then listen. Don't be, don't think that God's going to hear you because of your much speaking. Guess what? God knows what we need. God knows where you are. God knows where you're dealing with. And this is why when we pray, it doesn't make sense us trying to butter God up. You know. Wonderful God, awesome God, mighty God. And you know the thing you really want to say. Yeah. But you're going through this thing about, no, 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 that's not what prayer is about. Prayer is a discipline of relating to God in private so that you are transformed and can turn and relate to others in ways that are good and loving. That is what prayer is. Prayer is the discipline of relating to God in private so that you are transformed and can in turn relate to others in ways that is good and loving. And that is what effective prayer is. Um, the, the late uh, Dallas Willard, he said this, Accordingly, I believe the most adequate description of prayer is simply talking to God about what we're doing together. That immediately focuses the activity um, where we are. But at the same time, it drives the egotism out of it. 
Requests will naturally be made in this course of this conversational walk. Prayer is a matter of explicitly sharing with God my concerns about what He is too, uh, what He too is concerned about in my life. And of course he is concerned about my concerns. And in particular, that my concerns should coincide with him. This is our walk together. Out of it, yeah. I pray. Yeah. That's what Dallas Willard said. Um, Richard Raw, uh, the Franci uh, Franciscan monk, says this. Prayer is sitting in silence until it silences us. Yeah. Choosing gratitude until we are grateful. Praising God until we ourselves are an act of praise. Prayer is about the journey. Prayer is not about you hearing and getting stuff from God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Well, I was in prayer today and God told me to walk up the road, turn left, turn right, and stand there for 10 minutes. So what? Yeah. So what? Prayer is about transformation. It's about the change that God and the Holy Spirit wants to do on the inside of us. Prayer is not of us. Prayer is not about us getting stuff. Prayer is about transformation. Prayer is not about you seeing God at work. It's about transformation. Uh, 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 and and if the result of our prayers is not transformation, then it's worthless, it's pointless, it's meaningless. Prayer is about transformation. I remember we talked about prayer a few years back, and this is stuck with me, something that a great, awesome speaker said, who's sitting right with us today. She said, prayer is therapy for the soul. Mm -hmm. You remember that, Maureen? You said that. You said, prayer is therapy for the soul. Mm -hmm. Prayer is a channel for empathy. Prayer is a catalyst for action. Prayer is about transformation. And in the words of Brian McCarrano, prayer is a divine act of resistance because in order to be transformed and in order for transformation to happen in our lives, we need to resist our own pride, yeah. our own selfishness, our own greed. We need to set aside our pursuit, uh, our own agendas. We need to push out the things that are unhealthy in our lives. We need to work on forgiveness and reconciliation instead of re retaliation and alienation. We need to work on all of these things. We need to resist these things. And prayer is a defiant act of resistance. It's resistance against all of the things in my life that are unhealthy and not good for me and destructive. And the things that I need to work on. And Jesus says, when you pray, pray this. And what Jesus gives us, Jesus gives us in the Lord's Prayer five points. And I'm just going to give you these five points and then I'm, I'm, I'm out. But, but, but Jesus says this. He gives us an example of prayer. An example of a divine act of resistance. He says, firstly, pray this, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. The first act of resistance in this prayer is the resistance against exclusion, the resistance against alienation of others, the resistance against the aloofness of deity, and an invitation to, to intimacy with God. That's the first act of, 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 of resistance. You know, the first few words of the Lord's Prayer is important. Our Father. Everyone say that. Our Father. Not my Father. Not your Father. Not the Father. But our Father. You know, when, when we use the words my or yours or the, these words are too general. Okay? Um, but when we, uh, and they're too exclusive. But when we use the word our, what it does, it joins us yes, all yes. Together, He is our Father. And it doesn't just join us together, but it joins believers together and unbelievers together from all across the world when we use the word our Father. The word our, it, it, it pulls our image of God just from our own tribe, just from our own clan, just from our own type of people, our own colour of people, just from those that agree with us and look like us and believe like us. And it throws an image that is not constrained by the definitions and the distinctions that he makes. He's our Father. Those who believe and the don't believe, he's our Father. Those who have different beliefs, he's our Father. Yes. Those who agree with me or don't agree with me, he's our Father. Those who I like and I'm not particularly keen on, he is our Father. Those who I consider friends and those who I might consider enemies, he is our Father. 
Father, those who are good, those who are bad, and those who are what I would consider evil, he is our Father. When we pray, both the victim and the perpetrator, we move oh, them in, and that's the right. thing we have to do. But he is our Father. Eugene Peterson says this, with our, Jesus puts himself in our company. With the hour, we place ourselves in the company of Jesus and all who pray. You know, when, when we use the term Father, the term Father is not a term of, 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 of aloofness with God, a universal aloofness. It's not recognition of God's all power and God's omnipotence and all of that sort of stuff. But the term Father is a term of relationship and intimacy. And when we use the term Father, what we're actually being invited in, we're being invited into the dance of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When Jesus prays, our Father, Jesus is inviting us into his relationship with yes. his Father. Yes. So it doesn't matter if we have a good Father, a bad Father, or no Father. It doesn't matter what our image of Father is. Jesus is saying, this is who my Father is, and he is our Father. And we're being pulled into that relationship. Our Father who art in heaven. You know, many scholars believe that, that one of the better translations of this is our Father who, we, who are, who, who, our Father in the heavens. Or in other words, our Father who fills every molecule from the Father's solar system to the inside of my lungs. Our Father that fills everything. Our Father that already floods this place and fills this atmosphere. Our Father who is Closer than the air that we breathe. It draws us into the intimacy of being that God who is near. Jesus said, when we pray, pray our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The second act of resistance in this prayer is against our own kingdoms. Put your hand on your chest and say, my kingdom. My kingdom. And we all got kingdoms. We all got kingdoms. Our kingdoms of pride. Our kingdoms of selfishness. And there's a commitment when we pray this to be part of the revolution that God's kingdom brings. Richard Raw says this, to pray and actually mean thy kingdom come must also be able to say my kingdom God. Yeah. So when I say your kingdom come, what I'm saying is my kingdom has no place here. When we pray his kingdom come, how and his will to be done. We are resisting our own kingdoms and our own wills. We are resisting our own individual pursuits for power. We are resisting our own agendas. We are revolting against our prideful ways. And we're, we're praying for us to be brought in alignment where possible and abandoned if you yes. can't. Yes. Are we? Yes. That's what we're praying yes. for. When we pray this, we are sent surrendering ourselves to the pursuit of God's agenda on this earth through our lives. Yeah. Um, our kingdom come. When we pray, your kingdom come, not our kingdom, his kingdom come, your will be done. What we are doing is we are making a commitment to be a part of the radical revolutionary movement called God's kingdom, where evil, oppression and injustice is uprooted, where we stand for love and goodness, where we're willing to fight for justice, where we're willing to roll our speeds up and make this world a better place through our everyday living. That's what we're praying for when we say, your kingdom come, your will be done. That's right. And then he says, Jesus says, give us this day yeah. our daily bread. Everyone say daily bread. Daily, daily bread. Daily. The third defiant act in this prayer is the resistance against our own greed and our own selfishness. Put your hand on your chest and say me. me. And there's a commitment towards generosity and to us becoming great for other people. You know, N.T. Wright says this, he says, the danger with prayer for bread is that we get there too soon. We come to prayer aware of urgent needs and, or at least wants, and it's tempted to race through the Lord's prayer as for us on earth as it is in heaven, so that we can take a deep breath in and say, now look here, when it comes to daily bread, there are things I simply must have. And then off you go with the shopping list. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, and to do this, of course, is to let greed get in the way of grace. We've all been there, haven't we? Yes. 
We've all been there with the shopping list for God. You know, for the Jewish healer, this idea of daily bread would invoke the story of manna when God provided manna in the wilderness. And manna in the wilderness was this supernatural food. And the thing with manna in the wilderness, they could only take enough for the day. Yeah. They had to take it, and if they took more, it just spoiled. It was no good for them. You couldn't hoard it up. And you had to trust that the next day, God would provide. Man would be there and God will provide. And this is one of the things that the, 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 um, Jesus is trying to invoke in our understanding of, 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 of prayer. Jesus is trying to get us to understand about daily bread. He's trying to get us to understand about um, trusting God. Did you notice it says, give us? Yeah. It didn't say, give me. Oh. I've been guilty of praying, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. But the prayer says give us. And what that, what that should do, it should get us thinking about the needs of other people. Now, now it didn't say give us what we want. It says give us our daily bread. Give us what we need today. today. In fact, Luke's translation of it says, give us every day our daily bread. And, and, and the thing is, there is a difference between what you want and what you need. And when we say give us, actually when we consider the needs of those that we are in connection with. You know what, sometimes I've been praying, and there's something I want to pray about. And then when I've been praying for other people, and I've been praying, give us, give us, give us. I've actually gone, nothing, you don't need to pray for that. You've got your needs, man. Park it, leave it. You don't need to go on that. And that's what um, this part of the prayer should do. It should help us put our individual need in balance with our community need. It should get us thinking about other people and what we need as a community. It should help us temper our wants and help us to prioritise our excesses and help us to step back and say, Lord, I'm grateful because I've got everything. Give us this daily, give us this day our daily um, bread is an opportunity for us to realise actually this is what our daily need is. And I can help meet that daily need because of what God has done for me. And it gives us an opportunity to become bread for other people oh. and to meet the needs of other people. Yes. Because when you think about give us this day, yes. and you think, well actually, I've already got everything I need. Yes. In fact, I've got more than I need. And this person needs that. And so I can be the hand of God in this and bless that person. Give us this day. I think this part of the prayer is trying to move us away from anxiety. Yeah. Give us this day. You want to say today? Today. Yeah. Not tomorrow, because tomorrow's worries will take care of themselves. Give us this day. It's this idea. Don't worry about tomorrow. Trust. For today. And it's a divine act against our greed, our selfishness, and the move toward generosity. And how many of you know daily bread isn't about stuff? How many of you know it's not about money? And because let's go to the truth now. When we pray this part of the prayer, what are we thinking about a lot of the time? Stuff and money, aren't we? But you need more than stuff and money. What do you need to nourish you? Right. What do That's you right. need to nourish your soul? Right. What do you need for your own mental right. well-being? What do right. you need for your relationship needs right. today? What do you need for your marriage, for your friendship? For what do you need? Give us this day our daily bread. It reminds me of a man and woman shall not live by bread alone. Give us what we need for today. And then he said, forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And so the fourth act of defiant resistance in this prayer is a resistance against one, our own guilt and condemnation, and two, a commitment towards forgiveness and, where possible, reconciliation. Um, uh, E.G. Wright says, forgiveness is like the air in your lungs. There is only room for you to inhale the next level you just breathe out, uh, when you just breathed out the previous one. If you insist on withholding it, refusing it to give it to somebody else, the, the, kind, of, uh, the kind of life that they desperately need, you won't be able to take 
take any more in yourself, and you will suffocate very quickly. If the heart is open and able and willing to forgive others, it will also be open to receive God's love and forgiveness. But if, if it's locked up, it will be locked up to the other. Everyone breathe in. Okay. Hold that breath. Now try to breathe in again. You can't. And that's what N.T. Wright is saying. And sometimes in life, we breathe in, but we don't exhale. Yeah. We don't exhale in forgiveness. We don't excel in reconciliation. And then we wonder, why am I suffocating? Yeah, yeah. Because you've held on and you haven't breathed out. And so you can't take your next breath until you let go. You know, um, when, when we talk about forgiveness, forgiveness is scandalous. Yeah. The forgiveness that God offers us and pulls us into is scandalous. It's the embrace of God's answer that we can figure out how we work forgiveness out through every aspect of our life. How we forgive those who trespass against us. And what this part of the prayer is, is a resistance against, against guilt. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Sometimes we're holding on to stuff that we've done. God forgave you long time. The person you died against the gave you a long time, but you're holding on to it because you're, you, 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 you've allowed guilt and condemnation to rule your life. And, and, and it, it's, it's resistance against, when we forgive, it's resistance against retaliation and revenge. I no longer need to take revenge against you because of the, the wrong you did to me. I have forgiven you. That has no more power in my life. You know, forgiveness, forgiveness is God's choice to overcome bad and negative with love. Forgiveness then becomes our choice to overcome bad with the practice of better. Um, forgiveness. And, and what this, what this um, part of the prayer should do, it, it should help us unclench our angry fists and let certain things just be released in our life. And it's not saying that injustice is okay, or the wrong someone did okay. What it's saying is, that no longer has any power over you. Yeah. And he says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The fifth defiant act of resistance in this, in this prayer is resistance against our own lusts and desires, and a call to take a stand against our own destructive behaviour patterns. I love how Eugene Peterson translates this in the message. He says, keep us safe, Lord, from ourselves and the devil. Yeah. <laughs> keep, deliver me from me. That's what this part of, of the prayer is. And, 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 and you know, what, what, it, what it is, it's a, it's a prayer of us taking responsibility. Because how many, how many times, some of the stuff that's going, going on and going wrong in our life has nothing to do with the devil. And it has everything to do with the things that we are sowing into our own lives. And then, so it, it says, you know, if this part of the prayer calls us to recognise what our temptations are. And acknowledge those temptations. And, and, and it calls us to become part of the solution rather than part of the problems, you know. And this part of the prayer is saying, God, deliver me from me. And also the forces of evil and wickedness out there. He says, Lord, stop me from being a weapon of hurt for other people. Help me be a, 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 a process of healing for other people. He says, Lord, help me, not, help me not to be victims of evil and wickedness and help me not to be the perpetrator of evil and wickedness. That's what this prayer is. And so I finished with that and I've gone way over time and I'm so sorry for that. Um, but... but what we get in the Lord's Prayer is a defiant act of resistance. And it must be a defiant act. Everyone say act. act. It can't just be defiant words. It can't just be words. This is what you get in this prayer. If you pray it in that mindful way and you work through the process and consider the implications of what you're praying for, and if it pulls you away from our own kingdoms and our own agendas and our own greed yeah. and our own selfishness, what it will be, it won't just be words, but it will be a defiant act. It will be something that we work out in our own lives initially. And we will see that change and transformation in us. And as we work it out in our own lives, we begin to work 
work it out in our relationships with other people. And as we work it out in our relationships, we begin to work out that change and that transformation in the world uh, around us. We will work it out in our work. We will work it out in our callings, in our ministries, in the communities, in the various networks that we are a part of. And so let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And as Luke adds to the end, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. God bless you. Great is our faithfulness.